Dr. Anisha Durve is the Director of Acupuncture and Ayurveda at the University of Miami's Osher Center for Integrative Health. She is an author, Ayurvedic practitioner, yoga therapist, and meditation instructor. She will be talking to us this evening about the Eastern view of the mind, comparing traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic philosophy. We will have time for questions at the end of the session, also hopefully followed by a a meditation, um, a time, some time for meditation. Thank you again for joining us and I'll be turning it over to Dr. Derve. Thank you so much, Jen, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to the whole UCSF team that uh, coordinated all of this and invited me to this speaker series. It's a wonderful lineup and I'm really honored to be, to be included in it. I hope all of you are doing well this evening. I'm very excited uh, to share this presentation with you. So our topic for today is the Eastern view of the mind and comparing the philosophy from traditional Chinese medicines viewpoint and the Ayurvedic viewpoint. And because I'm a practitioner of both of these medical systems, I feel like I've got a really great um, unique perspective about just comparing these two, two systems together. So Jen already shared a little bit about my background, but I'm coming here from University of Miami's Osher Center and very excited to be partnering with um, the UCSF Osher Center for today's presentation. So before we go into the mind um, from these two different philosophical frameworks, I just want to take a moment to talk about why is this relevant and why is this important? And if we look at the mental wellness industry, I have a few statistics here uh, to share from the Global Wellness Institute about really how relevant this is. And so this is close to $120 billion industry back in 2019. And some of the main categories identified in mental wellness are self-improvement, meditation and mindfulness, um, nutraceuticals, botanicals, and then also senses, spaces, sleep. And they say that some of the numbers here overlap amongst these four categories, but this is one of the breakdowns that they created. So I think we live in a world where mental wellness is becoming increasingly, increasingly recognized as more important, but it is something that's been neglected for, for a long time. So most of my presentation today is going to focus really on Eastern philosophy, but I want to take a moment just to contrast the Western view of the mind and emotions versus the Eastern view. And so when we really think about Western medicine, it, its forte is really understanding a lot of the complexities of the brain just being a remarkable structure um, in the human body and understanding that the body and mind are connected as we understand and uncover more through research on the brain. But we tend to look at emotions as a very linear experience. So we look at emotions as affecting our limbic system, um, triggering a cascade reaction within our physiology. So we have nerve impulses that are traveling from our hypothalamus to affect our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And the, uh, everything is explained in a very linear cascade um, mechanism. And the Eastern view is a little bit different than that. So we don't necessarily look at the emotions as a, and the functioning of the mind as a purely linear um, relationship. So I'll start with traditional Chinese medicine, known as TCM for short. And in this system, we really look at the body-mind connection that each one influences the other. So if we have disharmony in the body, it's inevitable it's going to create disharmony in the mind and vice versa. And so we don't really look at treating only physical symptoms or only mental symptoms because we know there's always going to be a connection between the two. So anybody coming in with issues of either physical or emotional, we're always looking to create balance between both of these realms. And so we say that a calm, harmonious mind is called a balanced Shen, and I'll get into that term in just um, a few minutes here. 
And the Ayurvedic philosophy really looks at that body-mind connection as well. But one thing Ayurveda says is that the body is actually the container of the mind and that the mind flows through the entire body. And we have a very elegant system and more um, descriptive terms to really explain that relationship, which I'll get into in the second part of, of today's presentation. So I want to take a moment just to point out the diagram that's here on the side of the slide where we see this beautiful woman sitting in a meditative pose. And you can see this inner landscape of the clouds and the sky and the mountains and the trees. And so this is a very rich metaphor that's used in Eastern philosophy to say that it's not just our body and minds that are connected, but we are connected to the whole universe, that everything that exists in the universe exists within the microcosm of our bodies. And so just as we, if we were tending a garden, we would want to tend every aspect of the garden so things are growing in harmony with each other. And the same concept is that we want to grow um, and create harmony with all within all these internal aspects of ourselves. So that's just a very quick intro as we start to go into this topic. So the first part of the presentation of the Eastern mind, I'm going to start with traditional Chinese medicine philosophy. So for those of you who might be new to this, traditional Chinese medicine has been around about 3,000 years. Uh, it's abbreviated as TCM for short. And we have eight branches in traditional Chinese medicine, but acupuncture is the most popular uh, and well-known out of those eight branches. So we also include acupressure, um, herbal medicine, diet and lifestyle, tai chi as a form of moving meditation, um, qigong as a form of energy work, uh, tui na as a form of massage and body work. So all of these different branches of traditional Chinese medicine are practiced together in China. And for those of us who've been trained here in the East, we're also trained in all of these um, eight branches of, of the medicine, even though we're called acupuncturist and that's what most people know us by, we're also integrating these other limbs. So let's go into the traditional Chinese medicine concept of the mind. So the word Shen, is our Chinese uh, term for mind. But what's very interesting about this term is that it's actually translated into English as heart mind. And so there is a concept that the heart and mind are not separated. They are one entity and we know them by this name of Shen. Shen can also be translated as spirit. So it adds a certain richness to this term uh, which which starts to give us more of a feeling about what all does the mind encompass. So the word Shen, the concept of it is that it's one of the vital substances of the body. Um, it represents our consciousness. It represents this heart-mind connection. We can correlate it to the Western view of the mind in terms of regulating our uh, everything we associate with the brain, We're governing our mental and cognitive functions, ensuring proper mental health, that it governs our thinking, our insight, our capacity to focus, um, to be creative, to make decisions, our memory. The Shen is also what gives us the capacity to um, collect knowledge, to use our senses to gather that knowledge, and also the capacity to, to transform that knowledge into wisdom, into higher learning. The Shen also governs our emotional regulation. So anytime our emotions are out of balance, we would say that's a Shen disturbance. The mind, is, heart mind is disturbed. And also for any of us who suffer from insomnia, that is also a symptom of the Shen being disturbed. And so essentially from a psycho-emotional perspective in traditional Chinese medicine, any type of mental emotional issue, we are always looking to balance the Shen, to calm the Shen, to harmonize the Shen is some of the language that, that we use. So another important concept here in Chinese medicine is the word qi. I'm sure many of you have heard this term. Um, it's translated to mean energy or life force that's present in all living things. So all of us have qi or energy 
that flows through us and it flows through the body along specific energy pathways called meridians. And so our chi, this energy and life force within us, whenever it gets disrupted and that flow becomes unharmonious in different ways, it starts to create uh, different emotions. And so we correlate many of the significant emotions um, within us with some of the organs in the body. And so, for example, if we're experiencing anger, this is a feeling of chi rising. So that chi that should be flowing harmoniously through our body starts to rise up, which is why when we get angry, our cheeks get flushed, our face is red, maybe our eyes get red. So it's a very fiery, heated emotion that tends to rise up. Um, when we experience too much worry, we say this not the chi. If you think about when you're really overthinking something, your, your energy is getting knotted. And so this is one of the ways that we, the language that we use to describe how we create balance in the body is by lowering the chi if we're angry, of allowing the chi to flow more smoothly if we're worried. When we experience a lot of fear, we say this makes our chi descend it affects our kidneys. And so with someone who's experiencing a lot of fear, we would look to create balance by helping to raise the chi up again by whatever acupoints we select, whatever acupuncture techniques that we're using to create this balance. We say when we experience shock, like trauma, this is something that scatters our chi. And so it depletes our energy. And this is why it's so important to create harmony and recover from that shock as soon as, as possible because it affects our heart and it affects our, our kidneys. So there are many different benefits to acupuncture for affecting our mental and emotional health. It's a very effective tool to create balance between all these different aspects of our being, our physical, mental, and spiritual beings. One way I, I like to describe acupuncture is that it really starts to awaken our natural healing intelligence, because I truly believe our body and mind actually do know how to heal, but sometimes we get in the way of um, affecting our body's own intelligence and interfering with that healing process. So acupuncture can also really promote this feeling of well-being. So many patients will say they feel more energy, more focus, more joy after uh, receiving acupuncture care. It's a really holistic view that really empowers us to understand what's the connection between our body, our breath, our mind, our emotions. How are all of these things connected and how can we start to achieve mastery over them? So there's a very significant um, influence over our mind, our thinking patterns, our emotional patterns, Acupuncture can really powerfully reduce stress, and there's a lot of research to substantiate that. It can also help with releasing uh, subconscious traumas, repressed emotions, because it tends to just kind of bring things to the surface with this natural healing intelligence. And so any emotions that have been repressed, um, that have been ignored, that are really deep-seated, acupuncture is going to help bring that up so that we can release those emotions. So I find it's a very effective adjunct to psychotherapy. Uh, I'm never recommending that my patients stop doing therapy as they start acupuncture, but that they use these modalities simultaneously. And I've also had great feedback from therapists who've told me maybe they've had a client for a long period of time who just hasn't really made much progress or who has plateaued. And then this patient might start doing acupuncture and I will get feedback from that therapist that they're really amazed at how much their progress they're suddenly starting to make and how quickly they're processing their emotions or their ability to let go of things. So um, that's always really encouraging to be able to, to hear that. So this is just a list of some of the range of psycho-emotional disorders that we can start addressing uh, with the mind and using acupuncture and some of the other TCM modalities as well to help with. So in my practice, I see pretty much this whole spectrum of emotional uh, disorders. Even if this isn't the primary reason someone is coming in to see me, they might just be coming to see me with a some shoulder pain uh, and, or some type of injuries like that. But 
oftentimes if we've been in physical pain for some time, it's going to lead to some type of emotional imbalances. We tend to get depressed if we're experiencing chronic pain. We tend to have anxiety, um, stress. This is going to manifest differently for every person in their own unique way. But this is going to be very common that we're going to experience a big range of this uh, roller coaster of emotions throughout our, our lifetime, uh, especially if we're not doing anything to address it or to, to master it. So out of all of these emotions, I'm just going to talk about stress for a moment because there is so much research that's been done specifically to show the how acupuncture can help with reducing stress. Um, one of the most common questions asked is what is the mechanism of acupuncture? And to be very clear on this, this is still something that there's a lot of theories about how acupuncture works, but there's not one known specific mechanism that elegantly explains everything. So I'm sharing just a few of these theories here on this slide. Um, one is that acupuncture helps to modulate our parasympathetic activity. It has a very strong effect on our nervous system. So as our parasympathetic system um, gets activated, this triggers our relaxation response. So we start to experience maybe our breath slowing down. We start to experience being more calmer. Our heart rate starts to lower. If we have high blood pressure, that might start to lower. If we're experiencing muscle tension, rigidity, our muscles start to also relax. And so we start to experience this reduction of stress because our nervous system is, is definitely activated through the acupuncture mechanism. Another theory starts to explain how this works by saying we can look at our brain chemistry and see that as we insert acupuncture needles into the body, that this definitely affects our brain and creates a cascade reaction of releasing neurotransmitters, neurohormones, opioids, endorphins, um, serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, these are all of our body's natural feel-good chemicals. So we've all heard of the runner's high, maybe some of you are runners and have experienced that runner's high, and acupuncture is kind of the same way. You get kind of this acupuncture high where you're feeling elated, um, you're feeling lighter, you're feeling mentally more clear, and it's a, a significant change that you can start to experience within even the first few minutes of receiving an acupuncture treatment. And then after the treatment's over, that might be something that gets heightened throughout the rest of the day, or it can kind of spill over into the rest of the week as well. So as we experience all these feel-good chemicals and induce that relaxation response once again, this also will start to decrease our perception of pain. Acupuncture also affects our central nervous system. So it can help with all of our um, sensory, involuntary body functions. So it can help with, once again, regulating our blood pressure, our blood flow, our body temperature, our um, immune system gets boosted. So there's definite cascade reaction of our physiology and all the different parts and systems within our body that can be influenced. And then acupuncture has also been shown to really help improve our circulation um, throughout the body. So this oxygenates our tissues, this can help um, clear out the excess cortisol that has built up in our system. And so that also is part of this whole relaxation response that we're experiencing. All right, a little bit more research just about acupuncture and brain waves. And so this I think is really significant because I like to compare acupuncture to if you've never uh, experienced a state of deep meditation, acupuncture kind of gives you that experience without you having to put all the effort in of learning a meditation technique. So um, what happens with acupuncture is that we start to reduce our beta brain waves, which is what we're experiencing throughout most of our day. And acupuncture starts to induce the alpha brainwave state, which is what we have with our relaxation response. And also our theta brain waves, which is what we experience either in deep meditation, anytime we're feeling really creative, really inspired um, during our REM sleep cycle. And so most patients, as they're going into the acupuncture experience, 
they're not calling it the alpha or theta brainwave state, but they're really describing this, this deep state of relaxation that they're experiencing, which is quite powerful. So I think this is really important. And for anyone who feels like they have trouble meditating or they don't really know what that experience of deep relaxation is, I always encourage them to come and try acupuncture so you can experience that. And then in your meditation practice, you kind of know what it is that you're trying to cultivate um, to recapture that, that experience. All right, there's also studies that show acupuncture can help with our cognitive function. It can help with improving our memory, our concentration skills. It's excellent for students before taking a test, especially if they have test-taking anxiety. I will tell uh, students to come and see me the day before an exam so they can feel mentally alert and sharp and focused and really be able to concentrate and it reduces that test-taking anxiety. Um, it can help boost our brain power, our learning capacity. Um, it can also help with anyone who's experienced brain fog, for example, with COVID or long COVID symptoms. Acupuncture is excellent for dispelling that brain, brain fog and really creating clarity and lightness in the mind. So it can also help with Alzheimer's, but I usually tell people the early onset um, the earlier you come for acupuncture, the better it's going to be. So the more uh, chronic or severe some of these Alzheimer's symptoms are, it uh, might be a little bit too late to come and try acupuncture at that, at that point. Um, but definitely something that can really improve our brain health and be used preventively so that we don't start to mentally decline as fast. All right, um, so as we finish this section on traditional Chinese medicine, I just want to share with you guys my unique style of acupuncture. And really, every acupuncturist is going to have their own style, their own um, extra modalities that they're adding on, combining with the, the acupuncture. So it's really important to find an acupuncturist for yourself that you feel emotionally, energetically connected with. Um, and be able to experience their, their style of, of acupuncture. So for myself, I also include acupressure. Um, I like to teach my clients some self-acupressure techniques for them to do as well uh, that might be related to their specific symptoms. I like to include aromatherapy. I think essential oils are just such a wonderful way to induce that relaxation response. And we can start to work with different essential oils that are soothing, that are calming, that are grounding. Um, lavender, for example, is the most popular essential oil on the market, but it has a very soothing, calming um, effect and wonderful for, for reducing stress. Uh, once I have started the acupuncture treatment and the need, all of the needles are in, I always like to do some type of guided meditation, breath work to just keep deepening that relaxation uh, effect. And then I might give a short, simple affirmation for clients to repeat during the acupuncture treatment as a way to focus their mind, focus their thoughts. Qigong is a form of energy healing, similar to Reiki is the Japanese term for energy healing, Qigong is the Chinese term, and then pranic um, healing is the Indian term. So all of these can be used interchangeably, but it's the same concept of working on, on that qi energy prana flow through the body. And then acutonics is what you see in this picture is um, sound healing using the vibration of tuning forks that we place on the body at specific energy points where it's a really interesting and wonderful sensation where different tuning for forks might have heating or cooling um, energies. And you can just start to feel these vibrations in the body at certain points that also starts to create a deeper feeling of relaxation, which feels really wonderful. All right, so that's the first part of what I'm gonna share with you guys is this concept of the Eastern mind through the lens of traditional Chinese medicine. And now we're gonna switch gears and talk about this same concept of the Eastern mind with uh, the Ayurvedic point of view. 
And I know Ayurveda might be a new term for some of you, um, but I'll just give a quick one minute spiel on what Ayurveda is before we start to go through and define uh, the concept of the mind. All right, so I mentioned that uh, TCM is about 3000 years old. And Ayurveda is really the oldest medical system on our planet that dates back 5,000 years ago. So it originated in India, and it's a very holistic system of medicine that includes diet, lifestyle, herbal medicine, detox strategies. Um, it's a sister science of yoga, so it also believes in meditation, breath work, yoga poses as a way of yoga therapy to help heal the body. So Ayurveda has a very rich concept of the mind, and we look at not just the mind-body connection in Ayurveda, but we start to break down this concept of the mind in a much more detailed description that's very elegant. And so antakarana is the Sanskrit term, which means the faculties of the mind. And we say there's four aspects of the mind that we are that work in connection with each other. So the first, manas, is the sensory mind. And this is really the, the aspect of the mind that most of us are, are familiar with on a daily basis. This is our thinking mind, our feeling mind, our mind that's able to perceive, um, to use the senses. So most of us are really cognizant of this sensory mind throughout the day. Our buddhi is the intellect. So this is an aspect of our mind which is discerning, discriminating, it judges, it makes decisions, it uses cognition, um, retention, memory. And so we know there are certain times that our buddhi maybe is not operating. Um, maybe we are just kind of experiencing this mental fog or sitting on our couch, um, addicted to Netflix, for example, we're not really operating out of our, our intellect but our sensory mind is always kind of with us and operating at that at that time. So we've all experienced times when our mind kind of shuts down. We're not engaged with that intellect, um, with that buddhi necessarily. Chitta is our consciousness. So this is the aspect of the mind that is always present with us, but we might not always be aware of it. This is where our subconscious uh, mind might be more active at times. And so chitta, that is consciousness, is that aspect of the mind we're really trying to cultivate within our uh, deep meditation practices. And then the fourth aspect here of the mind is called ahamkar, which is translated as the ego. And I want to take a moment to just explain this and define this, because I know from the Western standpoint, when we hear the word ego, it has kind of a negative connotation to it, right? We talk about somebody with a big ego. We don't necessarily look at that in a favorable way. But the Sanskrit term here, ahamkara, so aham means self, and kara means shape or form. So ahamkara literally means the form of the self. And so this idea of the ego doesn't have any negative connotation to it. It is simply that element of forming our identity, creating our identity. When I speak about myself, I point to myself. So this is this, this is a way of ahamkara, of identifying myself. And so there's no judgment, there's no negativity here, but it is simply an aspect of our mind that's able to identify ourselves to be established in ourselves. And as a little side note here, um, I'll share the Ayurvedic concept of cancer is we say a disease of the ego. And so essentially every cell in our body has this feeling of ahamkar, it has a feeling of identity. And so when we start to develop a cancer cell, that cell, has an, an ego, an identity that is different from the rest of us. And so as that cancer cell really starts to develop this identity of I am a cancer cell, then it'll start to influence the neighboring cell next to it. And then that cell will also start to pick up this identity of I am a cancer cell separate from the rest of the body. And so as that grows, 
this feeling of another identity different from ourselves starts to grow. And so my spiritual teacher would always say, anytime we are treating cancer, working with cancer, we have to always address the spirit. We have to always address this, this separate sense of, of self. All right, a little bit of a digression, but I will go ahead and continue here with some more really interesting Ayurvedic uh, terminology. So another term that we use is manovaha shrutas. Now shrutas means channel, and we say there's 14 main channels in the body from the Ayurvedic anatomy perspective. And manovaha shrutas is the channel which carries the mind, and this is the most important channel. So vaha means movement, um, to move within that channel. And mano means mind. So it is the channel in which the, the mind is literally moving. So we say that this pathway of the mind is what creates this feeling of dynamic energy, stream of consciousness, this mental flow. And so every single shrotas um, channel in the body has a root, a pathway, and an opening. So the root of Manova Hashrutas, we say, is the heart and the cardiac plexus, the brain, which is quite powerful if you think about it. If we go back to the Chinese term we mentioned before, Shen, which meant heart um, and mind, this root of Manova Hashrutas is the same concept of heart and mind, heart and brain, um, heart and cardiac plexus. The chakra system, we won't go into detail in today's presentation because we don't have enough time, but the chakra system is essentially the seven um, centers or plexuses within the body that have a very strong energetic function and are very connected to our mind. And then we also have 10 uh, subtle channels called nadis that are connected to all of the five senses. So all of this, we say, is the root of the mind. The pathway then of the mind, we say, is actually the entire body. And so this is where Ayurveda says it's not just that the mind and body are connected, but the body is literally the container of the mind and that the mind flows through this whole entire body. And on the body surface, the mind actually opens into all of our sensory organs. It opens into our eyes, our nose, our um, tongue, our ears, our skin. It also, within our nervous system, the mind opens up into these synaptic spaces between our neurons. And it also opens into the marma points are the Ayurvedic term for the energy points that are all over the body. From the acupuncture perspective, the energy points are called the acupoints. And in both of these systems of energy points, there is a lot of overlap between points with the exact same same locations and sometimes the same functions. In the Ayurvedic system, we call these energy points the marma points. Um, and this is one of my favorite topics and something I specialize in um, teaching and training other practitioners in is really how to learn about the energy points, how to stimulate them through acupressure or other techniques, and how we can really start to access the mind our emotions through this process. So uh, to kind of summarize Manovaha Shrutas, the function of this channel is really thinking, feeling, inquiring, discriminating, um, desire, contentment, memory, communication. So all of the things we associate with the mind are, are related to all of the functions here of Manovaha Shrutas. So essentially, we look at the mind as the flow of thoughts, the flow of emotions. Most of us, that's our experience throughout the day. Our thoughts are constantly flowing. Our emotions are constantly flowing. And so Ayurveda des describes this as the mind is the movement of prana. Prana is similar to the Chinese term chi for energy. Prana means our breath, our vitality. And so as the mind is flowing with a river of thoughts, if we, if we visualize for a moment this river of, of water that is flowing, it can flow harmoniously and smoothly and without any interruptions. That, that flow of the river can be clear and it can also start to become polluted. 
Um, it can become disharmonious. It be can become stagnant. It can become disturbed. And so the flow of our thoughts, the flow of our emotions is very much like this flow of a river that we can control, that we can start to have access to as we become more conscious, more aware. Um, so every change in our mental, emotional state is also influencing our physical body. So I want to take a moment to just really define this term emotions. And we've talked about the movement of the mind. And the word emotion literally means that which is stirred within us, that which moves us. And so our emotions are, are part of our natural expression. It is normal for us as humans to have emotions, to have responses to things that happen in our day, when we get triggered, when there are stressors. Um, there is such a thing as healthy anger if there is injustice that has happened um, and we're experiencing some healthy anger. And this is something that we should be able to, to feel, to experience, to let that healthy anger move through us. The problem is when that time period is over and we're still continuing to hold on to that um, emotion and we're not able to, to let it go. That's when it starts to create disturbance and that's when it creates a chain reaction of other things that then start to go awry and affect our, our feeling of well-being. So in this healthy state of emotions, essentially, we really should allow our emotions to flower. We should allow them to bloom. We should smell their fragrance and then be able to release them without any attachment. If you look at a child, a child oftentimes in their innocence will just experience an emotion and it comes to the surface. They're not hiding it. They're not repressing it. They're not judging it. That all comes down the road as we grow older and start to self-critique ourselves um, and start to judge ourselves. But the innocence of a child is they just really experience that emotion and allow themselves to, to feel it. And that's really what Ayurveda teaches us, that we can really start to practice this moment-to-moment -moment awareness where we experience the emotions fully and really allow them to, to bloom. That's really the key to emotional health, uh, to be able to do that and not hold on for too long to those emotions. So I wanted to share a quote here from my my spiritual teacher and Ayurvedic teacher, Dr. Basantlad, he says that every thought, feeling, and emotion has an origin and a maturation process that is important to honor. When feelings and emotions rise up, it's important to be with them, but we rarely pay attention to the inner process. Every emotion has something to con convey. Every emotion has a story to tell but we are the ones who are not ready to listen. So either we are not there or we try to control it, suppress it, pack it, store it. And as a result, these emotions become suppressed and it leads to mental toxicity, which in Ayurveda, the term that we use for mental toxicity is ama. So really recognizing that every emotion has a story is important. So one of the beauties of this Eastern way of thinking is that if we don't um, honor these emotions, if we're not honest about what we're feeling, we suppress those emotions, there's always going to be a chain reaction. Disease will then at some point become inevitable. Those emotional symptoms will translate into physical symptoms. And so we need to have that, that clarity with ourselves to be able to face those emotions and deal with them head on. If we don't have the tools or the techniques to do that, this is where we seek the help of a therapist, a counselor, um, our community, our partner, whoever it might be, so that we don't hold it inside and that we're really able to, to share this. Um, I'll share a story of a recent client of mine who came with stage four esophageal cancer and came to see me a little bit later in his journey. And, you know, we were doing uh, common acupuncture protocols to boost the immune system, uh, to help with pain in, in certain areas. But 
during that process, as we started to talk, um, as we started to kind of explore his feelings around his diagnosis, talk about his journey, he confided at one point that he never really felt like he honored his voice. He always suppressed his emotions. He was always passive. He kept quiet when things felt uncomfortable, when he was in uncomfortable situations. He spent a lifetime, this is someone in their late 50s, he spent a lifetime of just repressing himself. And so as he made the connection with some of the tumors that had had uh, developed in his esophageal cancer, he really started to see how this was a collection of toxic emotions that had formed into these nodules that had created this pain that had eventually led into creating this, this for specific form of cancer for him. So I share his example because I feel with every client of mine that's coming in with such a diverse range of physical symptoms, we can always start to, once they get really clear and self-aware and are starting to experience progress with some of their physical symptoms, it allows them to start to look within at their mental emotional symptoms and start to make connections that maybe they had never seen before in, in their lives. And I think that's a really powerful part of of the healing journey is for us to explore that. Whether it's acupuncture or Ayurveda, it doesn't really matter whatever technique you're using, whatever system you're using to be able to make these connections between what am I feeling and what am I experiencing? And if we can think about not only each emotion having a story, but every symptom in our body is really just our body calling out our attention. Um, it doesn't matter if it's through reflux or pain or um, what, whatever the symptom might be. If we start to see that, okay, maybe I should listen to what my body and mind are telling me. Maybe there's a story here. Maybe there's a reason this symptom keeps repeating itself over and over again, that allows us to then experience a much deeper self-healing that really has a richness to it that really nobody else on the outside can, can provide. That has to come from us and uh, come from within to want to do that kind of deep healing work. All right, so another aspect of Ayurveda um, some of you who have maybe heard of Ayurveda have heard about the three body types and how each body type has certain mental emotional qualities. So I want to go through those three body types for you guys quickly right now, just to give you a simple overview. So each of the three types, Vata, Pitta, and Kapha, have positive qualities, and when they are out of balance, have negative qualities that are, once again, just are mind expressing something is out of balance, um, but it's nice to get an idea of which of these three types you might be. So for the Vata mind, um, this is a mind that is very creative, it's energetic, it's light, it's dynamic, it's flexible, it's spontaneous, um, really sharp perception. And so a Vata mind, when it is harmonious, is really just a very creative, light, inspiring mind to, to be around. When that vata energy goes out of balance, though, these same kind of light, space, and air qualities start to become too movable, too excited, too ungrounded, too spacey. This is the, the mind that's going to become very anxious, excitable, restless, fearful, um, nervous, insecure, so very hyperactive, very impulsive, very overwhelmed. And so some of you might be relating to these qualities and be able to see, yeah, this ex explains me exactly when I'm under stress. This is the pattern of symptoms that I start to experience. The pitta mind, in contrast, is the fiery mind. And so a pitta mind that is in balance is going to be very bright, very sharp, determined, ambitious, goal-oriented. A pitta mind um, has no problem with focus and concentration, um, being disciplined, being strategic. So a pitta mind is, can be a very bright, 
intellectual um, mind. But when a pitta is out of balance, we're going to have those fiery, that fiery energy starts to get overheated. So we start to experience fiery emotions. This person is going to get angry, irritable, impatient. They're going to get jealous, overly critical, frustrated, um, very intense. They like to debate, but their words might start to become harsh and overly critical. So I have the picture here of this pitta person with steam coming out of their ears because sometimes this is literally what they, they look like. All right. And the kapha mind. So a kapha person, when they are harmonious, they have a very um, compassionate, cheerful disposition. They're very loving, kind, generous. They can be very forgiving, very tolerant, um, very easy to, to get along with, very laid back. But when that kapha mind goes out of balance, this is governed by the elements of earth and water. And we start to see the earth element becomes really heavy. So it creates heaviness mentally, um, sadness, sluggishness, depression. Uh, it's very hard to get motivated. It might be um, very hard to let go of something. So they become stubborn, attached, possessive. So sometimes that kapha mind needs that like nudge to get them motivated, uh, to get off the couch, to exercise, um, to, to start to feel, feel positive. So I share all of these traits because all of us can experience, regardless of what our main body type might be, we could all experience vata, pitta, or kapha emotions. And it's good to be able to check in with that and see, is my energy feeling too light? Is it feeling too heavy? What emotion am I experiencing? And then Ayurveda goes into a lot of depth with how do we balance vata, pitta, and kapha through our diet, um, through our exercise, through our lifestyle techniques, through herbal uh, medicines, through detox strategies and techniques. There's lots and lots of options of how we can start to balance each of these three, three doshas. So as we've been talking about this whole overview of the Eastern mind and all of the ways it can go out of balance, um, how it can become unharmonious, it's also great to have the perspective of Okay, what should a balanced mind look like? Um, what should we strive for? How do we create this? So a balanced mind is one that has clarity. Uh, there is no confusion. It has compassion. There is no conflict. There's no judgment. There's no criticism. So I know this sounds for most people impossible. I have people all the time say, well, I am always judging myself. I'm always self-critiquing. I'm always my harshest enemy. And so this is something that is learned behavior that we have learned as we become adults. And it's something we can unlearn to get to this place of being a balanced mind that can be content, that can be compassionate, not just towards others, but to be compassionate for, for ourselves. So a balanced mind is going to be one that's very self-aware, um, a meditative mind that can really master, create self-mastery, that can be disciplined, that can be controlled, um, that's not controlled by our senses. So that's not going to lead us to addictions, but this ability to really be in the present moment, to not be limited by our past, to not be limited by our future, our, our anxiety or preoccupations about the future, but they can really be in the present moment. So this is really important and, and powerful. And what is the best way to achieve this balanced mind is really by learning uh, meditation. And so that's why I'd like to end today with a simple meditation practice. But before I do, I'm just gonna stop the share here and pause for um, any questions that you guys might have uh, about anything I've shared so far about the Eastern mind, either from the TCM perspective or from the Ayurvedic perspective. And I, you've done such a wonderful job of covering these two whole vast medical systems that have been practiced for thousands of years. Um, so I appreciate how elegantly you did that. And I'm also, as I'm thinking about some of the questions that came up for me during your talk, trying to figure out how to simplify things. But, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like given the pandemic, 
there's just been so like such a spike in anxiety and insomnia. And I have a lot of folks personally coming in saying, how do I deal with this? Mm-hmm. You know, I was maybe a little anxious before or, you know, coming in for their children or themselves saying, I'm, you know, I'm feeling really anxious and it's really affecting my sleep. I feel like mm-hmm. there's a lot of insomnia <laughs> globally. Yeah. And I'm just so curious from whether it is makes sense to talk from both a TCM or Ayurvedic perspective or choosing one, just can, you know, like what would the approach look like for something like that for the listeners in terms of thinking about this really, what feels like a really common kind of mental health challenge now is this mm-hmm. poor sleep and this anxiety and then kind of that self-perpetuating cycle. Absolutely. And if we go back to one of my very first slides about the Shen, you know, the definition of Shen is, is what can um, create harmony within the mind, but can also promote deep sleep. So it makes perfect sense if the Shen is disturbed, that it is also going to create anxiety and stress and insomnia, that these things are going to go hand in hand together. So it makes sense that with the pandemic, it was absolutely a very stressful um, event turning the world upside down, <laughs> you know, that we experience on a global scale, that this is going to affect all of us in different ways. It's um, a perfectly natural, healthy response for us to experience stress and anxiety to all of those changes that transpired. And the best thing is really to think about, okay, what is it that I need to do to now create balance and harmony um, in my mind, in myself? And it's not going to be a overnight solution. It's going to be a process of things that are going to help create that. So a meditation practice, a simple breathing technique, going to a regular yoga class, um, eating foods that are also going to help ground our mind are going to be a wonderful way to create that. A very simple Ayurvedic home remedy for insomnia is to, at bedtime, have a cup of warm milk It creates um, grounding, a feeling of nourishment, it's warming, and to put a little pinch of nutmeg powder. So nutmeg acts as a mild narcotic, and it's very heavy, it's very dense. And so the combination of the warm milk with the nutmeg powder really kind of acts as a tranquilizer. It really soothes our nervous system. This is something very simple, anybody can try. Um, almond milk in particular would be one of the best milks to to use. And so Ayurveda has tons of suggestions like this mm-hmm. of things that can be done. Um, suggestions m- might be tweaked a little bit depending on if you're a vata, pitta, or kapha mm-hmm. person. Um, that's where you need the guidance of an Ayurvedic practitioner to really be more specific about mm-hmm. what's happening and manifesting for you. But really, I would encourage people if you're having these different symptoms, once again, listen to your body, understand maybe why these symptoms have arose, don't have any judgment about it, and then be able to get the help that you need from a team of healthcare practitioners that can really give guidance on the whole process of learning to correct um, and create balance for you again. Great. I am going to buy some almond milk and nutmeg. <laughs> I feel there'll be a lot of folks buying it. That's such a great practical suggestion. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I know we have a few questions coming in on the chat, but I mm-hmm. would just like to do a follow-up question. Um, you covered so much of, you know, so beautifully parts of TCM and Ayurveda. And it seems like my understanding is digestive, the digestive part of the prescriptive, you know, the treatment is such an important piece. Mm -hmm. Could you briefly talk about the differences maybe between what diet recommendations for TCM versus Ayurveda might look like? And maybe that's too general, but even Mm -hmm. thinking about maybe for somebody with insomnia or anxiety, like how would those differ? How would they be similar? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, (laughs) My short answer to that would be, both systems have a very strong nutrition component, okay. but they use very different language to start to um, describe how to create harmony or balance through nutrition. Okay. So for example, from the Ayurvedic perspective, we talk about foods that are vata balancing, okay. that are pitta balancing, that are kapha balancing. Um, from the Chinese medicine perspective, we talk about foods 
in connection to different organs um, and the five elements. And so the language sometimes can be very different, but the concept is the same of how do we create balance depending on whatever is out of balance. There's a question here that I feel like might be a nice follow-up to, to this. And it's, I'm wondering what are the ways your awareness and practice of the both having TCM and Ayurveda help you treat folks and also potentially provide challenges. So kind of navigating, holding both, you know, knowledge, of, the knowledge of both medicines and how do you navigate between both of those? For me, I've been doing this for so long. I don't see it as a challenge. <laughs> I see it as just somehow in my brain, these um, two systems have, have integrated, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, diagnosing someone's condition, sometimes something really jumps out at me from a TCM framework. Sometimes things jump out at me from an Ayurvedic framework. Um, but essentially I still see them as similar philosophies looking to, to create balance and I might pick and choose, um, or oftentimes I'm kind of, um, combining, my understanding from both systems together into my treatment approach. This is a great question and, and is a little bit more specific, but how would you approach or how do you approach acupuncture or Ayurvedic therapy, for example, for reluctant adolescent <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, dealing with something like chronic pain and high anxiety, knowing that, you know, mm -hmm. potentially, I'm not sure if this happens for you, but maybe interacting with a family that has been interacting with more of a Western system and maybe has been on medications and kind of wants to start switching gears. So I think navigating that conversation and also interacting with, you know, the adolescent population. Sometimes there's reluctant adults as well, not just adolescents. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, I, I really believe that people come for help at the right time uh -huh. um, when it might be either coming from within, if it's an adolescent, maybe it's coming from a parent, but maybe one of their parents has been a patient of mine for some time and has experienced great re symptom relief and has really become a believer. So they want their adolescent to come and, and experience that. But I believe no matter who you are, what your background is, what your age is, I really believe in just meeting people wherever they're at and um, being able to explain my philosophy and whatever my diagnosis is, whatever my suggestions are, but really being very open to what my patient feels comfortable with. So I'm never really going to force anything on anybody. Um, there might be pediatric clients who are very scared of needles, who are not open to it. So I have a whole way that I'll work with the children to um, sometimes on the first visit, just do acupressure and not do any needling. And that's perfectly okay. Cause as they get comfortable and they start to just experience the power of the points, we talked about, um, the mind opening at these energy points on the body. And so we can really start to access our emotions, our consciousness at these points. And so sometimes just by doing some simple acupressure techniques, anybody can start to experience, okay, my emotion is shifting or the tightness I had in my chest is suddenly letting go or my shoulders that have been carrying the weight of the world. I'm just like suddenly able to like drop down my shoulders. There's a definite experience that people are having as we work with the breath, as we just start to experience touch. So my goal is to just really open people up to healing um, not trying to force anything, not having an agenda. I'm always just going to share here are all the options. Here's my perspective. Um, I'm ready to hold your hand and walk through this step by step with you. But I really think that has to be the approach is people have to feel invited and comfortable and open to really start to open the doors of, of healing. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's mm -hmm. beautiful. What training would you like in terms of someone's looking for a practitioner or provider? Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts on what you would recommend, what to look for in a in a provider? Um and and this is a funny coupling, but there's someone who's asking about like the evidence for Eastern approaches, which is oh, like, a, you know, that's a whole week's worth of talks essentially. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm thinking about for that sort of question you know, do you have thoughts on where to direct people that are saying like, this is really interesting. And I'd like to learn more a little bit about what the evidence is 
I think from kind of what our understanding of the Western style of evidence, do you have thoughts yeah, on absolutely. how you would direct folks to that? Yeah, um, you know, the evidence, the research in the acupuncture field has been pretty significant for the past 20 years in this country. So I usually point people to the NIH's website, uh, the National Institute of Health. They have their own branch called NCCAM of National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, although they might have changed, they've changed their name so many times, it might be a little bit different. But check out the NIH's website, look at their section on integrative medicine modalities. You can look it up by acupuncture or um, pick, choose different modalities, and there'll be tons of literature that you can look at um, to, to really if, satisfy your curiosity if you're wondering what the evidence is is with that. Perfect. And then what are your thoughts about, there are a few different people asking about how to vet a practitioner or find practitioners. You know, I think we all use Google, but then you're like, what do I do with this information? How do I kind of figure out who to go to? Right. So, you know, really when it comes to finding a practitioner, the most important thing is, do you feel a connection with them? Um, it doesn't matter who, who, you know, how long they've been in practice or what their skills or background is. The most important thing is that feeling of connection. But essentially, there are websites where you can find uh, acupuncturists, where you can find Ayurvedic practitioners. UCSF, uh, visiting the Osher Center for Integrative Health, I've been spending some time with their amazing, talented team of practitioners there. They've got wonderful acupuncturists that are very skilled, very experienced, who've been doing this a long time. So I would feel completely confident referring anybody to, um, to their services. Uh, the Osher team also has two wonderful um, Ayurvedic practitioners who are also MDs on staff and are doing group medical visits. So I don't know all the details of what they're offering, but you could definitely contact the um, UCSF Osher team um, to be able to inquire about signing up with those specific um, providers. Mm -hmm. But it's it's just important to feel like you've got a connection but also feel like this is someone who's experienced. If there's a specific condition that you have, uh, it's nice. Let's say you have severe anxiety. You want to know that that practitioner has specialized in treating anxiety, has had experience in that, so that they'll really be knowledgeable to um, help you on that that journey. This, I think, this question is so interesting, and and this came up for me too. And just the the idea of ama that each emotion has a story to tell. And the, one of the participants has a question here about elaborating on the idea that suppressing emotions is conditioned by society. I love to blame so much of our problems on society, but I feel it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to that a little bit because it does feel like culturally, we in the Western world, we do very have a very big mind-body divide and so navigating that conversation with patients, I can imagine can be, you know, maybe something they haven't thought of. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I think thinking about how that is actually a really important part of healing, but being willing to kind of access and think about and, and talk mm -hmm. about that. I'm just curious if you can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, um, I, I think that part of the slide is not trying to blame society for some of the things that we're not being vigilant about, but as a society, we're not necessarily taught at a young age to express all our emotions, um, to give ourselves that permission to feel them, to have a safe, safe space to open up about that. So that's something I think, you know, as parents with young girls, young boys, that that dialogue, that conversation should be started at a at a young age. Um, I'll share a story that uh, one of my spiritual teachers shared with me about a, a tribe, an indigenous tribe, and I can't remember at the moment, uh, recollect the specific name of this tribe, but um, what she shared is that whenever these children had nightmares, that they were always encouraged the next morning to talk about those nightmares with their parents. And then their parents would then start a very rich dialogue about trying to go back to that nightmare, 
to identify it, to see what was the emotion, to see where was it coming from, and to really give a voice and a form and a shape to whatever that emotion was in that deep-seated um, nightmare dream that they were having. And this amazing society had no mental illness because they had no anxieties, they had no fears as adults because they did this deep work with children at a young age to communicate, to express, to give permission to feel. And so there, there was nothing that was hidden in their subconscious anymore. They were just trained to face it, to talk about it, to be open with it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a great example of what maybe we're not doing in our Western society is that um, it's, it's just not something we're open and honest with. Even with my clientele that come to see me, it can take a number of sessions before people start to open up. And then even after they open up, it can take many more sessions to really process our emotions, our traumas, you know, whatever those, those feelings are, um, that it, it could be a lifetime of building up certain emotions. We're not going to get rid of it in one or two, two treatments, you know, it's going to take uh, that self investigation, that self inquiry to want to be honest, to want to examine, to want to explore, uh, those feelings that, that we have. So that's something that I think is on us, but it would be nice if in our society, we had people around us that were encouraging us at, from a young age that were influencing us so that these things um, wouldn't become deep-seated and wouldn't affect our health in a, in a negative way. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go away now <laughs> and just want to say thank you so much again for joining us tonight and say thank you to the participants. And I think at this point we'll be doing the guided meditation. So mm -hmm. I'm going to turn off my camera and let you take it from here. We'll keep this pretty short and do, you know, a simple five minute meditation or so um, that I would like for you guys to experience. And so, you know, talking about creating this balanced mind, the best way to do this that I know of is the practice of meditation, it's something we can do every day. We don't need a prescription. It's free. There's many different techniques, but meditation allows us to find a very systematic way to quiet our mind, to decrease our stress, to balance our emotions, to be able to go within, to, to develop that honesty, that clarity um, within our, our mind. So I'd like to do a really simple meditation practice with all of you today to help with cultivating um, this experience of the relaxation response and to hopefully give you guys um, an experience that you will be able to uh, replicate uh, on your own or seek out meditation teachers in your community. Or there's also um, lots of meditation apps these days where you can just press play and let someone walk you through a five minute technique, a 10 minute technique. So that's something I would really encourage all of you to, to do. All right, so as we go into our meditation experience right now, I'm going to invite all of you to just sit comfortably, um, sit up nice and tall if you can, so your spine is straight, drop down your shoulders. If you're wearing glasses, I encourage you to just take them off so that your facial muscles can completely relax. And then we're going to go ahead and close the eyes and just start by taking a few slow, deep breaths. With each exhale, give, your give yourself permission to start letting go. Let go of any stress, any tension, anything that's been weighing you down. Feel that just simply clearing with every exhale, giving yourself that permission to let go. Feel your breath becoming slower and softer. 
with each breath. Smooth, soft inhale and smooth, soft exhale. As you keep breathing slowly and deeply now, I'm gonna have you start to bring your awareness to the chest area. Breathing into the center of your chest, breathing into the heart space, and as you do this, if there's any heaviness, any tension or tightness in the chest area, once again, feel yourself letting go on the exhale and creating more space there on the inhale. This is where we tend to store our negative emotions, our deep-seated emotions, our heavy repressed emotions. So give yourself permission as you breathe into this space to just start letting go, releasing that heaviness, clearing that area. And with each inhale, breathing in this feeling of lightness into that space. Feel yourself becoming more present in your heart space. Feeling a stronger connection here. For some of you, you might even want to gently place your hand on the center of your chest just to feel that connection there. Feeling yourself breathing into your hand. Some of you might feel better without the physical touch, that's fine as well. The breath is still soft and smooth. Slow, deep inhale, slow, deep exhale. And now I'm gonna give you a simple affirmation to repeat, mentally repeat as we keep doing this breathing exercise. So the phrase is, my heart is free. My heart is free. And we're gonna con connect this and link it to the breath. So with each inhale, sit, mentally saying my heart, with each exhale saying is free. My heart is free. My heart is free. And as you say that, start to feel this lightness in the chest, in the heart area expanding. And we'll do this for about another minute or so in silence, mentally repeating, my heart is free. You can gently start to let go of that affirmation. Keep breathing slowly and deeply into your heart space. And I'm gonna have you place one palm over the other on your heart space here, breathing into your palms, taking three slow, deep breaths. Feel that connection to your heart.
gently releasing your palms. When you're ready, slowly opening the eyes. And just acknowledging the work that you've done here today to create this time and space for yourself, to be present with your heart, to witness your emotions. It's really deep, powerful work. And I commend all of you for, for doing that. I invite you all to try to do a very simple practice like this. This only took about five minutes, but five minutes of this kind of breath work or affirmation work every day can have a really long-term effect and can start to create changes that we're all looking for to improve our mental health and, and well-being. So I hope you're all feeling relaxed after that short little guided meditation experience. I want to thank you all for um, coming to this presentation today. 